everybody, this is Tom Paxton and you, you lucky people. You are listening to Dave Leskowitz on Dave's Gone By on UNC Radio. Welcome back to Dave's Gone By on this Saturday morning. And one of the proudest moments that I've ever had on this radio show was about 12 years ago. I, di I didn't have that many guests way back when. The, the show was a little bit different and a little less guest-oriented. But it was a thrill for me to start getting some guests who were important. So way back in September of 2004, uh, I was able to get on the program and talk to Tom Paxton, one of the finest American singer-songwriters that we have had in the past hundred or so, probably after Pete Seeger. He is the number one. He is the guy who gave us The Man Who Built the Bridges and uh, The Last Thing on My Mind and a couple of dozen more songs like that since he started his music career in the early 1960s. So we talked to him about 12 years ago, and it was great and an honor to speak to Tom Paxton, but guess what? He's still performing. He is still touring. He had a new album out about two years ago called Redemption Road, and we are thrilled that Tom is coming into our neck of the woods tonight in Fort Collins, which is about, as you all know, it's about 40 minutes drive from Greeley. So you're going to want to see him at Bohemian Nights. It's on 314 East Mountain Avenue in Fort Collins. Uh, Gabrielle Louise is opening for him. She was on this program a couple of years ago. So it really is kind of a, a welcome home nostalgia and still an honor and a thrill to be talking to the great Tom Paxton. How are you, Tom? I am fine, Dave. And I went uh, on YouTube and listened to Gabrielle Louise, and I was thrilled. I think she's really a talent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons. She's a local. I think she's a Coloradan. And she was putting out her first album back then, and we had her on, and she was delightful. And I'm so glad that you know everything is still continuing for her, and she gets to open for you, which is seriously major. Well, I get to follow her. <laughs> <laughs> I love the humility. I mean, uh, I wasn't kidding about the the whole Pete Seeger thing because, um, and when we talk about folk standards. You were there, especially in the early part of your career, just racking them up. And I, I do want to mention Pete Seeger, because um, some of the things I want to talk about with you are things that, are, that have happened since you were on here. And those include the passing of Pete Seeger. So do you have any memories or stories about him, of personally knowing him? Oh, I loved Pete Seeger. Uh, he remains one of my one of my idols, an example, an avatar of of, of how uh, this music matters, uh, how it's important to create this music and to sing this music as part of the of the large family that we all belong to. It's an ongoing tradition that goes back uh, hundreds of years, and it's it's an honor to be part of it. You also know him personally, I assume, especially... I did. I knew him personally. He was a very, very... He was exactly as you would think he'd be. He's a very generous, giving person. He was very forthcoming about, um, about his life and about his, you know, mistakes. Of course, he was always... Everyone remembers when Pete was uh, subjected to the blacklist uh, for his... Uh, previous membership in the Communist Party, which he uh, he disavowed. He left the party. He despised uh, Stalin and that whole clique, but he never gave up his principles. He, he said, I'm going to remain a small C communist uh, for the rest of my life. He didn't mind that I was in no way inclined in that direction. Uh, far left uh, as I had his members, membership in the Democratic Party. Okay, well, uh, these days, you know, that's if you're, you're in the GOP, that's considered pretty left. I think I read somewhere um, <laughs> in an interview yes. with you, though, that you were a little bit surprised that even as you've gotten older, I think you're 78 now, uh, you're still more towards the left than you thought would be. A lot of people get older, they get settled, they, get, they have an okay income, and then they start moving towards the right for safety. But you state leftist, sort of, leftish. Well, yes, of course. I'm, I am I am that terrible uh, creature, a liberal. <laughs> I, believe, I believe that um, government uh, operated in the right way is hugely important and had 
very beneficial. It was big government that built our our interstate highway system. Uh, it was big government that gave us the GI Bill that um, changed the face of this country and lifted tens of thousands and you know maybe millions of people from into the middle class after World War II. I think these are wonderful, wonderful programs. I mean, if they're, if they're not always operated properly, that's within our power to change. But I'm totally unapologetic about being uh, to the left of center. No question about it. Now, speaking of dropping a seed there, you mentioned that Pete Seeger was open about his mistakes in his career as well as the other stuff. What would be a mistake that you wish you had corrected in your life or career? Oh, <laughs> start. <laughs> Um, well, I tell everybody I started out wanting to be an actor, but I settled for the security of folk music. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I've made some career decisions that I've looked back and uh, wish I hadn't done about, you know, very boring stuff for people to hear, things about, uh, you know, deals with record companies uh-huh. and, and management and things like that. Um, basically... I feel extremely fortunate to have been able to continue to play and write uh, the way I have. Well, sure. Without any pressure uh, from anyone to change my ways. When I decided way back in the the 60s that I I wasn't going to go electric, for example, I was going to keep going along the path that I saw Pete following. On the one hand, that you know, I'm I'm proud of that. On the other hand, I realized that if I had gone electric, I probably would have been a dismal failure at it because I'm not an electric artist. You know, I, uh, well, I, I, don't, I mean, I, I think we one. actually we even covered this like 12 years ago, where um, you had one album that was fairly electric. Things I notice now, and that's actually one of my very favorite albums of yours. And then you moved away from that path. But I don't think the electric thing was necessarily a negative for you. I, th- I thought that album worked pretty well. My thought. Well, you know. yes, it did. Yes, it did. But that's a, that's an album, and and I uh, I was never tempted to have uh, uh, electric guitars on stage or to play one mm. myself. Uh, okay. A time or two, I picked up an electric guitar backstage, you know, that someone else was playing, and and messed around for a bit on it, and it just feels totally wrong to me. Hmm. I didn't realize um, that you wanted to be an actor at one point. Did, did you ever do any auditions as an actor? Not as a musician, of course, but, but as an actor? I was, hmm? I was passed a couple of times in, in a couple of uh, obscure plays. I usually played the part of a folk singer, which was a, a stretch. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, uh, listen, I'm, even as I sit here now, I'm a perfectly good amateur actor. Hmm. And let's leave it at that. <laughs> well, no, I mean, have you done community theater as an older person? Have you thought about, you know, no, just for fun? No, 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 I haven't. No, I actually, I have a dear friend who has uh, had a lifelong career as a working actor, and he he teaches now. And now that I'm, I'm uh, at loose ends, I mean, I, I have no one to... I have no one to go to. I lost, uh, lost my wife two years ago, so there's no one waiting. So I can I really go where I want to go, and now and then he, he does um, acting workshops, and so I thought I called him and said I want to come to the next one just for fun. I mean I'm I'm not uh, sniffing for a new career as an actor. No, no, but I'm saying just that's a tough life. No, but as I'm saying, even if you did like a local community show or took uh, an improv class or something, just for kicks, just to you know to scratch the yeah. itch that you had. S- 60 something years ago you know just just a thought yeah maybe maybe but i don't know if you i think if you take take a role in whatever and whether it's amateur or not you really need to commit to it mm. and uh, uh, i don't think i want to commit to something like that and there's a theater down in washington where i'm living now that offered me uh, a, a one-man show oh my gosh yeah and i said listen it, it, it's flattering but the problem is that i then have to do that show you know six nights a week well i assume it would be a concert essentially 
It would be your. You wouldn't have to. Basically, a, you wouldn't be doing a one man somebody else's script. It would be you doing a concert. No. Yeah, basically, yes. It would be slightly different, slightly more scripted, maybe some monologues and stuff like that. But the problem is, I don't want to commit to doing something six nights a week. Hmm. Hmm. Since you don't so have to I, anymore, I, yeah. I thanked him politely. Oh wow. Well, I, I just feel sorry for all the people who won't get to see it. Quite honestly, because uh, I know if if we were to put you off Broadway, doing that six nights a week, and you told your story in song from the early songs up to your last album and interspersed uh, stuff about your life, I think there'd be a few thousand people who want to see it. Quite frankly, so. I mean, I, I totally respect your decision and understand it, but I, I feel deprived as a theater goer and a music lover. So there. <laughs> How can I possibly make this up to you? <laughs> well, mm, that brings up another question. Uh, I, I want to congratulate you on the release of Redemption Road, which is now almost uh, three years old. It was your most recent studio album, which you put together and decided to do and raise money for it in this modern music economy by a Kickstarter. You were going to raise like 20, yeah. 20 grand, and instead you raised 32. Yes. So. We spent every dime of it on the album. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't take a penny in my pocket from that, but um, mm. Mm. It, it, was a, it was a splendid experience. Um, I'm of two minds whether to do it again. I think the next one. I'm going to do, I'm going to record an album early in November. It'll be quickly done. We're going to do it over like three days. We'll see how that goes. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to pay for that myself. I'm not going to ask anyone to contribute. But I think that the Kickstarter thing is absolutely wonderful. That, uh, you know, a lot of people have come up to me uh, since then and uh, introduced themselves as, a part of my Kickstart family, and it, you know, it's just an extra special kind of uh, a feeling to know that people want to back you with their dollars to to get more product out, more song. I certainly have a bunch of new songs to record, so we'll see Ooh. how it turns out. Oh boy, because the thing I, I went into your your Kickstarter thing yesterday just to look it over, and I was thrilled that you made one and a half times what you were even asking for, but it was also like. There's a lot of work. I had to do a Kickstarter campaign for a one-man theater show that I was doing last year in New York. And, you know, people uh -huh. were very kind and they donated. But it's also, you have to maintain it. You've got to do the video for the Kickstarter. You've got a lot of stuff to do. And then you have to fulfill. I mean, did, did you have to play golf with three different people? <laughs> yes, yes, but that's not... That's not work. That's kind of fun. Punishment. <laughs> and have lunch with a couple of people. I mean, I think that, <clears throat> you know... To do that once is exciting and fun and interesting. I am curious, and that's why you answered my question of whether you would do the whole Kickstarter thing over again for another album. Even though it worked out fantastic well, no, the first time, it's a lot of work. It was a pleasure. And it was yeah. not work. It was a pleasure. Uh, um, for one thing, I love to play golf. I, uh, I wish I played better than I play, but I love to play. And and you meet a lot of nice people playing golf. And uh, the, the three uh, Kickstarter uh, people who um, uh, contributed, and I played golf with them. It was it was it was great. I loved it. Um, that's and, great. Uh, yeah. What's what's hard about having lunch? <laughs> <laughs> if you're in the the city and you're in the neighborhood, why not? And I'm sure the people you meet are nice, and you know they're fans anyway. Um, so that 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 should work out really really well, and it has, which is cool. <clears throat> the other thing, I'm sure you, I'm sure you know um, Amanda McBroom, who wrote uh, The Rose. Yeah. Which I mean, I've never met her, but yeah. Their movie. Um, Amanda and I are, are email buddies, and uh, she is about to uh, record a new album this uh, in October in Nashville, and she's doing a, a Kickstarter uh, campaign, and I, I contributed to that. And uh, as, as it happens, she's going to record uh, The Last Thing on My Mind as part of that album. Oh, wow. So you'll, you'll get it back in royalties she's doing anyway. doing Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Well... Well, no, that's kind of cool. Anything you donate, you'll probably get back in royalties. So that that works. That's kind of a win-win. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 I put the money in before I heard that she was going to do oh, before something you in my that. mind. So I'm, I'm, I'm innocent of, of uh, uh, subterfuge. Well, but actually, what does she owe you? 
In other words, if you donated to her Kickstarter fund, was there a premium that you're getting? No, I, I didn't. I, I, I asked for no premium. Oh, nice. Very nice. Cool. Um, the, the one thing that I'm a little happily surprised about is that a year or so ago, you had mentioned that you were going to stop touring. You're, you're just not going to do it anymore. And here you are on a sort of a north, well, now you're in Colorado, but after this, you kind of have a, a northeast mini tour around Virginia and Maryland. Um, are, are, have you gone back on that? Or, you know, you'll do yes, dates here and there. It was, uh, yeah. it was a clear case of self-deception. I thought I was going to stop touring, and I'm not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, because touring gets harder as you get older into I, your 70s. I like what Willie Nelson said. Someone asked him uh, if he was going to retire, and, and he said... Uh, and what would I do then? Uh, make music and play golf? Which is what he does already, but yeah, okay. Yes, <clears throat> yeah. And so, um, I mean, I, I love performing. I hate traveling. Right. You know, well, I, yeah. it's, you gotta do it. Um, but I, I love performing, I love meeting people, I love uh, uh, the people who come to the shows, they're all really great. And I love hanging out with other musicians, I just spent uh, uh, last weekend up on the north shore of Lake Superior with uh, some of my fellow songwriters, and we uh, we had a lot of fun, and I wrote a couple songs together, and uh, I, I just love it. So why should I stop? Well, no, that's what everybody would say. It's just for for yeah, people yeah. the the grind of physical travel and airports and buses that gets to be you know, and, and hotel room after hotel that gets to be a drag. But I cannot tell you how I despise airports, but <laughs> there you go. One of the other good things that, I, that seems to be happening and that I'm amazingly uh, happy about also is albums that you released you know, after, after you left uh, Electra Records in the early 1970s. You did yeah. go on, as you said, to have some good record deals and bad record deals, but some of those albums that have been, I mean, they're on my shelf back home in New York, as albums, and ha no offense, but I haven't heard them in 30-something years, they seem to be coming back on digitally or on CD. The albums like Peace yeah. Will Come and Something in My Life, and uh, you know, even your first album, The Man Who Built the Bridges, which I never even had way back when. Um, how's, how's this happening? Well, I released uh, The Man Who Built the Bridges. That's on my label. Ah. Uh, but I just got uh, email the other day that... Uh, Rhino has uh, released on the 50th anniversary of uh, Outward Bound, which was my third album, I think, for Elektra. They've just released it on CD. And it's been 50 years since that was done. Well, I've had Outward Bound on CD for a few years now. They probably did another, re like a 50th anniversary re-release. Yes, so. Yeah, but, yeah, but I already, I've had Out Outward Bound on CD for at least a decade. Uh, I don't know if it was Rhino or who put I can probably go to my shelf right now and pull it out and tell you. I think they, maybe they, they put Morning Again and Outward Bound on the same CD. If you hold on, I'll, I can tell you. Aha. <clears throat> yes, I'm, I, my memory is good. Electra Classics put out a two CD set with both of those albums and some extras. Uh, like an electric oh, version. You know, one time and one time only. And, and, but anyway, but it's nice that, again, they're keeping those... Uh, newly current on CD as well. So a question might be, uh, I, I think the, the one album that I've never had and seems virtually impossible to get is this, this one you did called Saturday Night. Is that ever going to see the light of day somehow? Oh, I, I hope not. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I hope not. I, it, it, it's a very, I think it's a very poor album. Um, the one that hasn't come out on CD that I'd like to come out is called uh, New Songs for Old Friends. It was done for Retreats, and mm. I recorded it live uh, in, in London, and uh, I like that album, but uh, it's never yet come out on CD. Now, do you have any say in that, or is it only Elektra that has, you know, the, the say? or or Retreats album, and I, I, I don't know, maybe if, you know, if I offered to buy it or something, they maybe they would sell it to me or something. I don't know. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm really gifted at business, and uh, uh, 
I guess there are a couple people I could talk to about that. Maybe I will. Yeah, ju just for history's sake. Just for com you know, completionists like myself who yeah. want to hear what Better you're doing. Night was a dreadful album, to be honest with you. Um, well, what was dreadful? I mean, was your songwriting off? Was the production value was bad? I think, uh, I think the songwriting was a little off at that point, and uh, the production was not good. Um, yeah, was not, uh, those two albums were not a happy experience. I mean, things okay. got a lot better later. Because yeah. there was another album from around that period called, called Something in My Life that I hadn't heard good. in years and forgot about. That I was just album. listening to it yesterday. It's good. good. Something in my life? You don't like that one? No. Oh, wow. Okay. No. Maybe I was just in a good I mood I, yesterday. <laughs> I, got back on, I got back on track, I think, uh, when I did a couple albums for, for Vanguard. Oh, yeah. Well, the new songs from the Briar Patch. From the Briar Patch yeah. and, and uh, uh, Heroes. I think they, they, I, got, I got my mojo back then. And you kept really, it. Really? Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, my my recording really got fully realized uh, in '95 when when I did. Uh, um, Can you hear uh, Not not something in my life, but um, wearing the time. Oh, that was good. Yeah, it was the first album I did in that. Jim Rooney producing with his incredible uh, group of players, um, and everything I've done since then, I've I've. I've been pleased with, you know, not proud or anything, but but oh. I thought, you know, they they represented uh, the best of truth. Now, um, a lot of people from your cohort, or the, the ones who are, thank God, still left, uh, were asked about two or three years ago when the Coen Brothers movie Inside Lewin Davis came out. Um, uh -huh. How realistic was it? How much was based on? Dave Van Ronk, how much was based on this person or that person, or do, did you see the movie, <clears throat> and do you have any thoughts yes, about yes. its veracity? I saw the movie, I liked the movie very, very much, and I, I had a lot to say about it. Um, for one thing, it has nothing to do with Dave Van Ronk. I mean, it's based on his book, but his book was about what it was like back then. And Lewin Davis was an entirely fictitious creation by the Coen brothers and a really interesting character. Um, I knew people with some of those same qualities of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, <laughs> uh, self-defeating people uh, like Lewin Davis. Uh, what I noticed mostly about the film um, th that was not what I remember was in the film nobody uh, nobody laughed and we laughed all the time. Hmm. Everything was funny. We laughed at and with each other. Well, that's because you were all high. No, just kidding. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> we weren't. Um, I was very, very seldom high. I didn't like it. Um, we were young. We were enthusiastic. We were. We were learning uh, to perform, so it was a, it was an exciting, an exciting kind of life, you know, and it was fun. We laughed all the time, so I didn't see that in the movie, but that was their movie. They made a movie about people who didn't laugh in it. I thought the movie looked very much the way things looked. Uh, the, atmos the atmosphere was very reminiscent. The stage looked the way those stages looked, very bare. Um, I thought that the performances were terrific. I loved the way they sang The Last Thing on My Mind. Uh, people want to know if that character was me, uh, only insofar as he was coming in from Fort Dix. Um, I personally would have drunk paint from a can before I would have showed up in my uniform in Greenwich Village. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, come on. That's but, true. I mean, these these are quibbles. I thought it was a really good movie. Cool. I thought it was a good movie, too. It was not the happiest film ever. 
But, uh, oh, hardly. Oh, not happy. <laughs> Although I still, and, and I torture my wife with this, I, I was just like, um, I will constantly quote the woman holding up the cat, saying, where's his scrogum, Lewin? Where's his scrogum? Which is a, a beautiful scene. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just love that. We are talking, by the way, with Tom Paxton. Do you have a couple more minutes? Because uh, cause I'm having a blast. I do. Oh, wonderful. I do. Wonderful. And, of course, as I said, it's an honor and a thrill to be talking to Tom Paxton. And you can be part of that honor and thrill. Because you can see him this evening in Fort Collins, just a few miles away from where we are here at the radio station. He's going to be playing tonight at the uh, Bohemian Nights, as the, the place is called. Gabrielle Louise is going to be his opening act. She's been a guest on our show, too. So they're both friends of the neighborhood. And the club is at 314 East Mountain Avenue, right in the heart of Fort Collins. Go see Tom Paxton. Go to his website, TomPaxton.com, as well. And since we're speaking of the happy times and the fun times, and, um, and also uh, people who have left since we have talked, do you have any Dave Van Ronk memories? I have a thousand Dave Van Ronk memories. First, let me tell you that what has not been announced about tonight oh, sorry. Uh, is, is that accompanying me will be Rich Moore and Molly O'Brien. Great. Um, Rich, I, I missed his first name, or his last name, Rich what? Rich Moore, Moore Molly and Molly O'Brien. Great. Have they been uh, with you for a while? Have they been sort of your aides du camp? It, yeah. Uh, they they're like, when I'm in Colorado, they live in Denver, ah. and they and they played Bohemian uh, not too long ago as as um, top of the bill or opening act. I'm not sure which, but uh, oh my God, have you heard Molly O'Brien? You've heard Molly O'Brien sing on Prairie Home Companion. Oh, okay. I'm she sorry. Has one, I really has one of the great voices, um, and Rich is just an amazing guitarist. So that'll be fun. Yeah. And now, as for Dave Van Ronk. He was my best man when I married my wife, Mitch, in 1963. Uh, I met him in 1960. Uh, he was um, uh, he was playing at a coffee house on McDougal Street called The Commons, and he was also hiring the other performers. So he would hire me. I would come in from Fort Dix, and he would hire me for uh, Friday and Saturday nights. And uh, I think I made something like... Uh, $10 a night. Ooh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I did, how do you spend that kind of money? You know, um, but what that meant was that in the following week at Fort Dix, I didn't have to go to the mess hall for lunch. I could go to the PX and buy a cheeseburger hmm. because I had all these, these folk bucks to spend. <laughs> and uh, uh, Dave, Dave was a big bear of a guy. He, the... Uh, done a little commer uh, uh, merchant sailing before he became a folk singer. Uh, grew up in Brooklyn. He was the best red man I've ever met. Mm. He had read everything and retained it all. He had a tremendous repertoire. Uh, lots of old blues. Uh, and then he'd, uh, uh, he'd cross you up by breaking into Swinging on a Star. You know, would right. you like to swing on a star? As I say, he was a he was a big big guy, and you know people uh, thought of him as being kind of menacing. But he was a pussycat. He didn't want any trouble. He wasn't looking for trouble. But we all respected him. Uh, he was there before we were. He was a little bit older than we were. He knew many more songs than we did, and somewhere along the line, he acquired uh, the uh, sober could. Mayor of McDougal Street, right. which was the title of the book that he wrote. I'm forgetting whether it was Christine Lavin or, or Jill Sabu. I think it was Christine who took uh, guitar lessons from him at some point. It was she? Christine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did, did he ever teach you any, or you already had your guitar picking down and you didn't need any... Uh... He gave me one lesson, and it was the most crucial lesson I ever took. It was right after I got out of the Army. He sat down with me and taught me three-finger picking, which is the basis for practically everything I do on a guitar. Whoa. Essentially, it's a steady beat with the thumb, bum, 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 and then the interposition of the first two fingers 
in or with or whatever with the, that steady thumb beat. And it was an agonizing, I, I just couldn't get it. And then finally, I did get it. And once I had it, I had it forever. Wow. But it was Dave who taught me. Now, speaking of the people of that era, 10, 12 years ago, we talked about Bob Dylan. We're not going to talk about much about him. Not that he isn't worth talking about, but I'm sure you're asked about him all the time. But, but he did finally, uh, on some level, repay some some favor there because in the expanded edition of his Another Self Portrait, as I assume you know, they released his version of Annie's going to sing her song. Was that a surprise yeah, to you? Was it about that? This is it's actually pretty funny. Uh, oh yeah. It must have been about nineteen seventy. Dylan and I were sitting in the bar next to the Bitter End, and he said, "You know that song of yours, um, Annie's going to sing her song. Said, I like that song. I, I'm going to record that song." And like forty years later, he did. <laughs> well, no, no, he recorded it in 1970. He released it 40 years later. Another self portrait. Is that what happened? Okay. Oh, yeah, no, he, he didn't suddenly do it in his new croaky kind of Sinatra voice. He, he, yeah, yeah. It was unreleased material from um, yeah. the another self portrait sessions, and it, and it finally came out. It's, it's nice. It's, I don't think it's as good as yours, but it's surprisingly good. The funny thing about it is that not one note of the tune that he sings is, is the original tune of mine. The lyric he got exactly right, mm -hmm. totally different melody, which works very well, I must admit. Yeah, no, I mean, but, hey, at least he gave you, he gave you credit, because he used to do that yeah. you know, way back when, keep the melody, change the lyrics, and, uh, you know, other people... I've always, have, been, I've always yeah. been fond of Bob. I haven't spoken to him in a very long time. We live in different parts of the country, sure. and uh, we travel in different routes and stuff, but... I admire I admire the man uh, enormously. I think he's um, th there's an element of genius oh, well, yeah. about Bob, and, I, and I'm I'm very 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 careful about the use of that word, but I think it applies to Mr. Bob. Are there other musicians that you've either worked with or followed, or just that, that you would also put that sobriquet to? I'm not sure I understood that question. Yeah, because I tried to phrase it so elegantly and I really screwed up. Who else would you call a genius? <laughs> <laughs> of, the, of the people in your circle or even outside your circle musically, would you who, use who that would term? would I call a genius? Yeah. Nobody. Whoa. Wow. Nobody. Not, not even Woody. Uh, a genius to me is someone who changes the landscape. You know, mm. Picasso was a genius. Sure. Art after Picasso was different. Beethoven was a genius. Now, Bob Dylan is not Picasso and he's not Beethoven, but he changed popular music. He changed American music. That's hard to do. Oh, sure. That's hard to do. You know, the word that the convenient word that I use for everybody else, like Woody and Pete and and uh, Ray Charles. Mm. You know, I call them masters. They're masters. Oh, that is a good word. So maybe Chuck yeah. Berry and Hank Williams as well? Yeah they're, yeah. they're masters. They're not geniuses. Hmm. And I'm not saying Bob is a genius. I'm saying there is genius in what he has done. So I don't mind if you, if you want to call him a genius, go ahead. I won't argue with you. Well, would you call yourself a master? I would hope so. Yeah, I call myself a, I call myself a, a really good journeyman. Hmm. You know, I'm I'm proud of, of, of a lot of the songs I've written. Yes, but I don't. Uh, I think it's silly to inflate inflate one's opinion. I'm I'm just happy. I'm happy to have written some of the songs I've written. I know they're good. Mm. Are really re some of them are really good, but you know. The same can be said of a lot of other guys. So uh, uh, a lot of other women. Uh, oh yeah, of course. So it's it's you know not something I uh, spend a lot of time thinking about. That's right. Well, I, I would like you to think about one or two songs, I, and these are kind of old ones from back in the day. But we can we can do one or two new ones as well of the genesis of like where you were 
what you were thinking about when you wrote, for example, bottle of wine. <laughs> were you under a that's bottle a of good, wine? That's a good example because um, in in '63. I was doing 90% of my work still at the Gaslight on McDougal Street. And, and I was invited for the first time to the Newport Festival in 63. And that happened to be uh, the, the, the year that Mississippi John Hurt had been rediscovered and brought up there. And I got to see him in an afternoon workshop. And then that night, uh, uh, in front of the full house of 18,000 people. He just knocked everybody out. And then, amazingly, a couple of weeks later, he came and played at the Gaslight with us for for uh, a couple of weeks. We got to hear him three or four times a night, you know, and I just ate it up because I loved his ragtimey, syncopated kind of stuff. It's marvelous. And after that experience, uh, my brand new bride, Midge, and I uh, started out across the country uh, on, on a tour. And every time I took the guitar out, I started playing what became the melody of Bottle of Wine. Da -da 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 -da. And um, it wasn't until we got out to uh, L.A. that I finally got tired of just doing that. And I sat down and I wrote the lyrics. Uh, and they came very quickly. Uh, it's one of the few times when I've written the melody before the words. Oh. And, and it became a hit song. You would think I would learn something from that. But, <laughs> um, uh, so I started singing it out. And, and I, I always said, you know, I was inspired um, by uh, uh, hearing Mississippi John Hurt. So Dick Waterman, who was uh, taking John around and looking after him and everything, um, he got mad at me, and he said that I should give John part of the royalties. And I said, mm. I don't understand your thinking. It, I mean, the words are mine, the melody's mine, and my, I pay tribute to John, but I'm, uh, it's my song. And later on, he, he cooled off. He said, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. And I've, I've never failed to, uh, uh, to credit John with inspiring me with his ragtime playing for that tune. Uh, then the tune was translated into French. Ooh. It goes, uh, Jean le bouté, sacre bouté, vous te me laisse tranquille, je vous te quitte, je vous m'en allez, je vous recommence mon vie. And it's sung by everyone in France who knows that song. School children know that song. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, there are no, no big recordings of it, so I've never really made any money from it from France. Oh, oh. That's kind, that's kind of a kick, though, to have a song uh, part of a culture that you, know, that you have something to do with. Yeah. And then also, who knows how many children that you kept from becoming alcoholics because they hear that word. It is a prohibitive <laughs> tale. You know? well, there's that, yes. Yeah. And speaking of prohibitive tales, uh, one of the best anti-war songs I think ever written was... Jimmy Newman. Now, you were in the military, so for you to come out of that and write yeah. a song about a soldier not making it, you know, through the eyes of a friend who, who yeah. sort of does make it, was there a particular, like, it was another day of what was happening in Vietnam and you just sat down and you're like, eh, or what germinated that song? You know what? I, I don't remember the day of writing that song. I do know that the war, of course, was very much on my mind all the time. And um, I've always had a, a great respect for for uh, the military. I'm, and I, I fist bump them all the time. Uh, it was, I mean, they were never my problem. My problem was people sending them, right. or they sent them and telling them to do what they did. Um, I know that after that song came out, I got a letter one day from a kid in a VA hospital. And he said, I just heard your song, Jimmy Newman. And I want you to know that I went through exactly the same thing as the song. He said, I was, I was in a medevac hospital. I was talking to this kid. And in the morning, that kid was dead. Just like the, the song, Jimmy Newman. Hmm. 
so, I mean, that really, uh, really got to me. Um, John Denver did a brilliant recording of it. Yeah. Uh, actually, the way he ended the song, uh, I borrowed from him to end it the way I end it now. It's his ending. Um, uh, but uh, that was... That was a hard song to write. It was a hard. It's a hard song to perform. Hmm. Um, because and it's I just emotional, or why? Yeah, emotionally. Yeah. Um, because it, it's a song where you know, gradually um, you learn as as the narrator learns little bit by little bit that Jimmy Newman is not in fact going to get up. Right. Uh, that's not really clear to the narrator until the last verse. Um. I, I I think the style of that song I owe to uh, uh, Jacques Brel, the French, the Belgian uh, singer songwriter, who was who was very theatrical. I mean, songs would uh, start low and then build, and that's what Jimmy Newman does: builds to a climax. Yeah, wow! Well, right, many songs like that. No, but I'm so glad I asked about that song. That's just. Wow, great! And I, mean, I have to ask one more. It's it's it's. I love it's your most famous quote unquote song, but it's one that may be the most identified with you on some level. Is the last thing on my mind? Were you, um, you know, did you have a fight with Midge or a previous girlfriend? And you know, not at all. Oh no! Oh, I mean, when, <laughs> when I started singing that song at the Gaslight uh, in the spring of sixty four. Uh, we we hadn't even been married a year yet, and uh, I would sing that song, and our friends would come up to me afterward and say, you know, is uh, everything okay? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just a song. It's just you know how would I feel if song. Uh, and in fact, we uh, we had uh, nearly fifty one years together, so um, I, I guess everything was all right. Uh, I and wrote she, that song yeah, in something yeah. like 20 minutes. I can't believe it. Hmm. It really came out so fast. And the, and the tune was right there. And uh, talk about timing. I wrote it just in time for the first Electra record. Wow. Yeah. Now, I, I again, when we talked all those years ago, uh, you were you were still married and Midge was, was still with you. She was ill for... Uh, a while before she passed? A long time, yeah. Nine or ten years. Was, um, I mean, obviously that that was difficult. Did you feel, um, you, you were, her, I guess, on some level her caregiver? What did she have? What was it, by the way? She had a condition called scleroderma, which is one of the autoimmune uh, problems. It uh, involves the hardening uh, of the organs, not the arteries, but Ooh. the organs themselves. And it's, it's gradual, and it's um, irreversible, and it took a long time, but it, then it took her. Was she herself through most of it, or through the last? Yeah, she was. Uh, not so much the last year, because uh, uh, she had to have uh, really heavy pain medication, mm. and... Uh, so it, it was it was a very gradual thing. I mean, I was not fully aware of I was not even fully aware that 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 the end was coming. Wow. I mean, I was so used to taking care of her and having her uh, uh, need help and medication and everything that it was uh, it was the way things were, you know. And then all of a sudden it was over. Had you though spent eight to nine years grieving so that by the time that, that happened it was I wouldn't say it was a relief but it was almost like oh you know okay move on or was there still this like oh my god 52 years what now it's, uh, it was a lot like that yeah it was um, I'm not sure I'm I'm not sure I'm on my feet mm. in that respect yet I mean I'm, I'm so glad I have my work to do you know uh, you have kids oh yeah yeah two daughters three grandsons uh, they are immeasurably dear to me 
and you get to I see, see them, them all the time. Oh, good. Yeah. My younger daughter Kate lives in the same building I'm in in, in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, and and Jennifer lives just 25 minutes away. Uh, so I see them all the time. So you don't feel isolated. That's Back a huge, in June, yeah. I went to uh, the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, Jennifer mm -hmm. is a history professor, and she was the historian on a Smithsonian tour of the Highlands. And so I went along on that. We spent uh, 10 days together in, in Scotland. It was fantastic. Oh, oh good. Because, you know, there, there's that feeling of, you know, when you're with someone for all those years and then you're alone, but you're not, I mean, you are alone, but you've got your daughter in the same building. You've got another daughter, you know, can drive yeah. there in no time. That's just a huge thing, I think. And, and I assume a circle of friends they, as well. Yeah. Hmm? The operative word you just said, though, is alone. I'm alone. And uh, it's tough. But the hell with it. I mean, not, that's life. I'm not the only one. You know? Oh, well, I mean, do you, it's, it's probably still too early to ask, but do you see yourself not being, you know, quote, alone, alone, you know, once you hit maybe 80 something and, and going back out? Maybe? I don't even, I don't even think about it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you, you know, I'm just, you know. Um, but it's, it's um, the thing is, you get to travel, you get to play. You're not alone when you're playing music in a room full of people who want to hear your songs, man. That is very true. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the reasons why I love it so much. Wow. Well, I have loved very, very much talking to Tom Paxton. You will love hearing him and being one of those lucky people in the audience if you go tonight to Bohemian Nights in Fort Collins. He'll be appearing there. Gabrielle Louise will be opening for him. Um, what, what was uh, something more? Your, your, it was O'Malley and Moore. Help me out with your... Um, Molly O'Brien. Mo O'Brien, sorry, yeah. And Rich Moore. Rich Moore will be accompanying Tom Paxton. So, Tom, um, God, I, I hate to end this because I could go on for hours with you, but uh, it's, it has once again been an incredible honor, an incredible pleasure. What is um, what do you listen to when you listen to music for fun? What's on if you have an iPod? If you believe in them, <laughs> you know, is there something that might surprise oh, yeah. us that that you listen to? What? I I like. Uh... Tim O'Brien, John Prine. Um, uh, I did a whole long tour last year with Jana, Janice Ian, and I love her. Yeah, she was on our show a couple of years ago, too. God bless her. Listen yeah. to a lot of classical music, and oh. I love opera as well. Hmm. Um, I hate operetta, but I love opera. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I love Schubert. Hmm. Any particular reason, or melodies, or, or what? What is it about Schubert? I don't. It's his sensibility. There is such pure, pure emotion coming from him. Uh, but it's always it's always controlled. I mean, he's never schmaltzy. Hmm. Um, anyhow, great fun. Well, great fun talking to either listening to Schubert or, or talking to you. Both are great fun. And um, I want to thank you really, really very much and wish you much continued good health, continued good music. Thank you. And, and, and do you have a name for the album that you're going to be working on that you're going to do, like, quickly? In... Yeah, we're going to call it the Silver Spring Sessions. The Silver Spring Sessions. I can't wait to hear them. Thank you. Best of luck. And, uh, and, and everything. Bye, Dave. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.